Welcome, folks. This is All Minus One Story Time with Bill. This is the segment where I read to you from great stories. Nonfiction works, of course. Um, perhaps we will do some fiction in the future. Right now, we are covering COVID 19 The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab. So let's get into it. This is 1.2.1.2, the economic fallacy of sacrificing a few lives to save growth. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, we'll see what he has to say about that. But apparently the, the people that are dying, the very small percentage of people that are dying compared to the entire economy, it's more important to close down the entire economy for all the people that are still living and sacrifice the economy because I guess the people that are dying would have cost us more in the end. I don't know, but I presume that is what the next segment is going to say. It says throughout the pandemic, there has been a perennial debate about saving lives versus saving the economy. Lives versus livelihoods, this is a false trade-off. Untrue. This is the fundamental trade-off that we all make when it comes to survival. The problem is, is we live in wealth and we don't understand what it means to survive. Very few of us do. Very few of us who have had to face our death in potential situations. Um, there used to be a show on Discovery or one of those channels, Animal Planet, I shouldn't be alive. And I remember watching a couple, like first date or second date, they go off into the woods. I think out in California or out in Yosemite somewhere. Um, in any case, they get off into the woods and they go off the, the beaten trail and they get lost and they have worked themselves down into a gorge, unfortunately, and can't get out. And this couple, of course, hadn't been intimate or anything like that. They hadn't been together very long. It was like a first or second date. And they were together for about a year and a half afterwards. Why? Because they went through a survival situation together where they were lost and stranded for like a week or something before they were found. The relationship didn't work out. But that fear and that working together of trying to survive and that shared experience brought them together. We don't have that anymore. That's why we complain about everything. That's why we are completely unsatisfied. We don't work lives that satisfy us because we have every need, need met. And we are wired psychologically to be concerned of danger. And when there is no danger, we have to create danger. Anyways, it says, this is a false trade-off from the economic standpoint. The myth of having to choose between public health and a hit to the GDP can easily be debunked, leaving aside that um, not insignificant ethical issue of whether sacrificing some lives to save an economy is a social Darwin proposition or not. Okay, social Darwinism, generally speaking, eugenics. Okay, it is not. We do it all of the time. If we didn't do this, we wouldn't allow anyone to drive to work, right? You wouldn't ever be allowed to go outside because the chances of you leaving your house and dying are much greater than you uh, dying at home, at least by like motor vehicle accident or a uh, secondary or tertiary party, right? So could you die of heart disease or cancer or whatever and be home? Sure, of course. But what I'm saying is, is that leaving the home itself incurs risk. So anything he says after this is just nonsensical. All he's saying is, is well, that's a eugenicist type of point without trying to say eugenicist. And it's not. It's not at all. Deciding not to save lives will not improve economic welfare. Here's an interesting thing. Another interesting thing. We have people all the time that put themselves in dangerous situations for economic reasons. Should we not then invest in those fields anymore? Like deep sea fishing, firemen, police, military. Uh, let me think. Uh, tree climbers. Uh, 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 Guys that work uh, power lines and, and that kind of stuff. Construction, especially high-rise construction. Are you going to tell me that that the trade-off with that, that we shouldn't do that anymore? 
because those are dangerous jobs. 90%, I think 99%, something like that, uh, of all deaths on those jobs, by the way, are men. So not only is it dangerous, but it's sexist. Should we just stop all those industries? Just a question, just a question. The reasons are twofold. On the supply side of permanently loosening the, the various restrictions and the rules of the social distancing results in an acceleration of infection, which almost all scientists believe it would. Uh, no, I don't think almost all scientists believe it would. All scientists you are willing to listen to, and therefore you're going to frame it that way. More employees and workers would become infected and more businesses would just stop functioning in the immediate. But that's not actually true because what you did instead was is you shut down all the businesses, Right. The people that you are giving instructions to, Klaus, who went and attended your little forum at Davos, they shut everything down and talked about how we needed to keep things shut down. So what is the difference between if the business shuts down because the employees get sick over the course of two months or three months versus if the government shuts everything down for a year? After the onset of the pandemic in 2020, the validity of this argument was proven on several occasions. I don't think so. I don't think it was proven at all. I think you're full of it. They range from factories that had to stop operating because too many workers had fallen ill. Uh, yes, meat packing plants to some extent. This did happen and supply lines. Most of this too was artificial. Guess what? That lasted about two months. Primarily the case for work environments that forced physical proximity between workers like meat processing facilities, of course. And naval shipyards uh, stranded be uh, because too many crew members had been infected, thus preventing the vessels from operating normally. Uh, right, because nature takes its course, just like in economics, traditionally classical Aust Austrian, or even the Chicago School of Economics, you allow nature to take its course, you don't do any bailouts, and guess what? It's done and over with quickly. That's why the, the stock market crash of 1920 and 21 were over within a year, and we entered a a period of boom for almost 10 years until the Great Depression hit. And that, my friends, was artificially caused by the Federal Reserve Bank and other bankers manipulating the uh, money supply. So, and the interest rates. An additional factor that negatively affects the supply of labor is that around the world, there were repeated instances of workers refusing to return to work in fear of becoming affected. Again, your fault, Klaus. Your fault because the people who you think should be in charge, who are part of your little cabal, are the ones who made everyone panic about this. Instead of saying, no, it's okay. The folks that are dying are the old people. Like Dr. Drew said this. Dr. Drew, Drew Pensky of Loveline, you know, all them years ago with Adam Carolla and, and, and uh, uh, still uh, often consulted today by media outlets. Dr. Drew Pensky said this will be like H1N1. It won't be that big of a deal. It'll be horrible. He said, I had it, but we shouldn't be flipping out. Many people who were very prestigious, far more prestigious than the folks that they typically get or the folks you see on CNN, people that have been on multiple boards, have worked with multiple governments over the years, have said, no, we should not act in this manner. Yet you refused. Why? Because you have an radical environmentalist agenda. And that agenda for sure, is to essentially impoverish everyone to save Mother Earth and to collect folks into cities. And that's what all of this is about. In many large companies, employees who felt vulnerable to the disease uh, generated a wave of activism, including work stoppages. Okay, that's the individual's choice then. Again, where in any of this did the government have to step in? You don't want to go to work because you're afraid of getting hurt or sick or something. Then don't go to work. I had to make a conscious decision to walk into a jail six days a week. Six days a week, walk into a jail. I didn't want to be there. I wanted to be home with my family. I didn't want to deal with jerks. I didn't want to have to get into a fight, although that wasn't most of it. But I didn't want to have to deal with people trying to lie to me constantly. I didn't want to have to deal with a horrible administration because they had no leadership skills. And they were all a bunch of cronies and, and nepotists. I did not want to deal with a flood where I had to deal with sewer water on the floor or, you know, someone's medical issues or all the other crazy, gross and insane things that I had to deal with for years. But I did it because that was the paycheck that I was collecting and I wasn't going to collect it otherwise.
on the demand side, the argument boils down to the most basic yet fundamental uh, detriment of economic activity, sentiments. Because consumer sentiments are what really drive economies, a return to any kind of normal will only happen when and not before confidence returns. Again, wouldn't be an issue if you did not have state propaganda media all over the world to include the United States. Individuals' perceptions of safety drive consumer and business decisions, which means that uh, sustained economic improvement is um, contingent upon two things. The uh, or sorry, contingent again, upon the two things: the confidence that the pandemic is behind us, without which people will not consume and invest, and the proof that the virus is defeated globally, without which people will not be able to feel safe first locally and subsequently further afield. What about the folks who are just sick and tired of it because they see the evidence before their eyes? Did, did you account for that one, Klaus? Is that your point number three? Because it doesn't look like that there's any more to this paragraph. What about those folks that were sick and tired of this back in June? Hmm? August? November? January? We're approaching mid-March now. The logical conclusion of these two points is that governments must do whatever it takes to spend whatever it costs in the interest of our health and our collective wealth for the economy to recover substantially. Both an economist and public health specialist put it, only saving lives will save livelihoods. Making it clear that only policy measures that place people's health at their core will enable an economic recovery, adding, if governments fail to save lives, people afraid of the virus will not resume shopping, traveling, or dining out. This will hinder economic recovery, lockdown, or no lockdown. I, none of this makes any sense with, compared to anything he just said. Only saving lives will save livelihoods. Well, if you destroy every single business, where and including local, personal businesses, right? Where are the livelihoods going to come from? Oh, I know. I know. Your corporate interests that are bailed out. That's where. Your corporate interest, that is Klaus Schwab's, that are bailed out because they're the ones who are now in charge. Everybody has gone bankrupt in the last year. Almost everybody is either hanging on by a thread. I think a third to a half of all small businesses have closed. It's probably more because I haven't seen a lot of reporting on this. Um, and it's not easy to get the numbers. We will have the numbers in a year or two, I guarantee you. Whose market shares went up? Amazon, Walmart, any other big conglomerate? Who's calling for bailouts? Hollywood? <laughs> they, they literally were. That, that's absurd. Only saving lives will save livelihoods. Then every time someone dies, then the economy crashes. Like, let's just put it simple terms. Every time somebody has a heart attack or car accident or something else, that's someone taken out of the pool of income earners, of producers. Does the economy crash then? How many thousands of people die in a singular day in the United States? I mean, it's a legitimate question. Because according to Klaus Schwab's thinking, people died automatically means economic recession. But for some reason, closing down all businesses and allowing those livelihoods to completely fail does not. Again, the gaslighting is unreal. If governments fail to save lives, people afraid of the virus will not resume shopping. Uh, again, what about those people who are just sick of it? This will hinder economic recovery, lockdown or no lockdown. No one would worry about it. See, what we should have done was the initial two weeks just to get our heads around it, right? And I only say this based on me being aware, very aware of preliminary information coming out when, when this was first occurring. And I said, I get it. I understand. Having worked in those systems, the healthcare system and elsewhere or hand in hand with those folks for many a years, I got the idea and I'm not an authoritarian in any way shape or form but I got it let's let's protect our infrastructure okay didn't work so a month goes by this is stupid let's ease up on everything let's start opening back up 
let's not demand all these restrictions. What did we go? Three, four months before masks started becoming a thing? But don't do anything, by the way, guys. Covered that in the quick shot the other day. Um, go look at the CDC's most recent study published just the other day. And also go look at the Danish study. There is almost no difference between if you wear one or if you don't. The CDC study is not conclusive as it is not a global study. That is every nation on earth. We can look at Argentina having the most restrictive lockdowns in the world, the longest lockdowns in the world, and they had a 60% infection rate. What is the difference between the 60% infection rate, Mr. Schwab, of those people not being able to go to work and you artificially closing it down? Please answer these questions. Because what you are saying right now is not logical. It is only a sales pitch. Only future data and subsequent uh, analysis will provide incontrovertible proof that the trade-off between health and the economy does not exist. Wrong again. And there are economists that have done this over and over again. And we have looked at from the beginning, there ha have been people that have analyzed the data. There have been numerous studies on this that have stated that nations that locked down fared no better than nations that did not. That said, some U.S. data collected in the early phases of reopening, some states showed a drop in spending and working, even before the lockdown. Everyone locked down nearly immediately. It was the end of March. And by May, I'm pretty sure that states that didn't lock down, locked down. And all of the reports out of every state were the same. 80% plus of this disease that you have a 99% chance of surviving, 80% of the deaths were of people who were like 70 and older. It's amazing. The other thing is, is those people who are 70 and older have a 94% of surviving it themselves. Most of these people weren't even in the workforce. Andrew Cuomo said, we were surprised that the majority of these folks were already out of the workforce. They found 60% of folks who developed and died of the COOF or with the COOF, however you want to look at it, died at home or died while being primarily at home if they later on went to a hospital or something and were already isolated because they were retired and had very little human interaction. 60%. Of course, we know what Cuomo did, as well as Tom Wolf and uh, Gretchen Wichmer, to the elderly folks by putting COVID infected young, healthy people in nursing homes, as well as elderly people back into nursing homes. They inflated their numbers on purpose, folks, for reasons, and then they tried to hide it. You want to go back up here to the social Darwinism thing, the eugenicist thing. Notice how careful he is with his language. He doesn't say eugenics because he knows that's a left authoritarian talking point. And by the way, folks, leftism is always inherently authoritarian. There is no such thing as is, uh, libertarian leftism. It does not exist. If there is a social safety net that you do not volunteer to, then there is force being applied to you. And that means that it is authoritarian, is it not? say, Bill, that's too simplistic. Yes, I know. I'm very, very black and white with these things because it is simplistic. It is based upon first principles. To confuse it otherwise is just you trying to justify your evil, your want to subject other people to your willpower. You cannot do that, folks. You have to allow them to be willing participants in a relationship with you whatever that may be, friendship, romantic, you know, the, the gas station attendant, how you exchange money, whatever it is, your doctor. Those are all relationships. They need to be voluntary, not by the force of a gun. If we take this to the most extreme and I use force in a relationship sexually, we call that rape. Well, that's why the comparison is made to the tax man, right? I'll say no more. Because uh, certain words 
are not like to be said certain topics on the uh, the YouTubes, at least from what I understand. Anyways, it says that said some U.S. data collected in the early phases of reopening in some states showed a drop in spinning and working even before the lockdown. Once people began to worry about the pandemic, they effectively started to shut down the economy, even before the government had officially asked them to do so. A similar phenomenon took place after some American states decided to partially reopen. Uh, consumption remained subdued. Again, people weren't working. Why would it be? Why would we have an abundance of consumption when people hadn't worked after reopening? You're being illogical for a guy that has a degree in numerous things, numerous doctorates, including economics. Unless you're just a, a bold-faced liar or an intellectual moron, which I, I think it's the last of the two. This provides the point that economic life cannot be activated by fiat. What? What? What, Mr. Schwab? Well, you're the one who's all about the, this, this fiat economy, about bailouts, about propping people up, about this, this, this stakeholder capitalism. What are you talking about? But it also illustrates the uh, predicament that most decision makers experience when having to decide whether to reopen or not. The economic and societal damage of a lockdown is... Uh, glaringly obvious to everyone while success in terms of containing the outbreak and preventing deaths a prerequisite for a successful opening is more or less invisible there is no public celebration when a coronavirus case or death doesn't happen leading to the public health policy paradox that when you do it right nothing happens this is why delaying the lockdown or opening too early was always such a strong policy temptation. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? This is uh, analysis or paralysis, sorry, by analysis is what he's talking about. This is folks in the government wanting to not take the blame. That's what it is. Folks in business not wanting to take a blame. Uh, leaders in the healthcare system not wanting to take a blame because they're not leaders, folks. We don't have leaders. We have irresponsible human beings who pass the buck constantly. I'll tell you right now to your face that a leader owns full responsibility of all failures from everyone below them on down. At some point, the buck stops with the person in charge. And those who are would-be leaders, they throw the lowest man on the totem pole under the bus instead of mentoring him. And this is why we don't have leaders, because that is the way of the world, and it has happened for a very long time in the modern world, because we have no conception of true morality or ethics, because we do not have God. However, several studies have sh since shown how such a temptation carried considerable risk, too. In particular, coming to similar conclusions with different methodologies modeled what could have happened without lockdown. According to one conducted by Imperial College London, wide-scale rigorous lockdowns imposed in March 2020 averted 3.1 million deaths in 11 European countries, including the UK, Spain, Italy, France, and Germany. That is a uh, motivated study, I have no doubt, because all the other studies comparing nations show no statistical difference. The other led by the University of California, Berkeley, concluded that 530 million total infections corresponding to 62 confirmed cases 62 million confirmed cases were adverted in six countries, China, South Korea. Well, South Korea didn't lock down. Not like, not like here. And what they did do, they opened back up quite quickly. South Korea was open by June, guys. It was fully open. They had a few outbreaks. They didn't do what we did. Iran, France, the U.S. by uh, by confinement measures that each had put into place. The simple conclusion in countries afflicted with registered cases that at the peak were roughly doubling every two days. Governments had no reasonable alternative but to impose rigorous lockdowns, except for the WHO doesn't recommend that. Pretending otherwise is to ignore the power of exponential growth and the considerable damage it can inflict through a pandemic. Because of the extreme uh, velocity of the 
progression, the timing and forcefulness of the intervention were of the essence. Well, here's what should have happened, guys, just, just logically speaking. Two weeks to slow the spread. Yeah, I'm not uh, one to, to really want to give the government that kind of power. Should have foreseen that they were going to get carried away with it. What I was concerned with at the time was bugging out, making sure that my family was safe, um, making sure that I was packed and ready to go, making sure that if there were riots that were going to occur, which I knew would occur, which eventually did occur because, well, the mainstream media, again, lockstep, knew exactly what to do, and they kept bringing up things that we're going to get people excited. And here in the U.S., with the majority of uneducated, idiotic folk, and I mean even the folk who are intelligent, who just are uh, fed propaganda, they suffer from Dunning-Kruger effect, they believe they know more than they actually do. Uh, case in point, the study that was just done of the folks who thought that there were a thousand unarmed black men killed last year by police, when it was like 27. A... Ridiculous magnitude of difference, right? <laughs> 27 compared to 1,000. Huge difference. But people think that. They think right now that, uh, you know, when they hear a report about uh, black LGBT women, lesbian women being killed, it's automatically white supremacy when the, the majority of the time, the perpetrator is of the same race. That anti-Semitism is perpetuated by white folk when it's usually Middle Eastern folk or folks that are Muslim or black, at least in big cities. This is the case generally. Same with the Asians. We saw this recently. So much to the point where they said, well, the Asians, we don't want this to be at the, the expense of the black community. And folks, this has nothing to do with if you're black, you're a criminal, right? That's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are certain communities that are kept in this position. They are kept enslaved mentally and emotionally. And all this stuff is drummed up and put out by the propagandist in order to create chaos in our society. And these folks are actually victims of this greater oligarchical cabal. I always say we got to feel sympathy for these people. What's the problem? Well, the biggest problem is they don't have good male role models. Well, how do we fix that? Well, we can't fix that when in that part of the world, women are brought up to think that they're perfect, that they don't need no man. They can raise a kid without a man. That's perfectly fine. They can raise a boy without a male example, which is completely antithetical to biology. We know with when uh, elephants in Africa, when the males were hunted down for their tusks, there were no males around. The, the teenage elephants, if you would, will go around rampaging and doing all kinds of crazy destructive things. Guys, we don't have to look far to see what our nature is. We can see it and observe it as the Bible said, as Paul says in the book of Romans, in the beginning of Romans, that one would know God and understand the creation of the universe based on the observance of nature. And we can see our nature in the observance of the nature of animals. Of course, we can just study ourselves as well, but we want to lie about everything here. And this, this book is nothing but lies. It's nothing but lies. It's not a reasonable perspective in any way, shape, or form. Schwab is ignoring all kinds of evidence. And what was this, the page before I, I read here? close out here in a minute guys oh it talked about all the deaths there, there's no evidence of that whatsoever what were the projections remember what fauci said there were going to be two million americans dead or something more than that by those standards the left has already forgotten you know trump did a pretty good job right we need to start talking about realities folks and i know i say this stuff all the time I might be one of the few people out there saying such things. I know there are others, but we, we, we don't have a lot of mainstream strong presence, which means that we have to build each other up and we have to learn to unite. And we need to quit thinking of everyone as little satellites and fight infighting between each other because you don't agree exactly with this point or that point. We need to do better because they have the people highly divided and they are highly organized, highly powerful, highly influential, and well, well funded. 
We need to do better. And part of that is just being aware and making people aware. That's exactly what I'm doing now. Hey guys, I will come back with 1.2.2 growth and employment. I'll look at Schwab's solutions, if you would. Mind you, this was written nearly a year ago, but we'll see what he has to say. Again, for this to come out so quickly, this was mostly a ghostwriter and stuff that they had talked about laying around and probably took, taken from speeches. It, it, Trust me, this was no, no thing that just came out of nowhere in a month or two that he wrote. This has been part of their deeper plans for a long time. Let's not forget Event 201 back last, not past October, but in 2019 in October, right as the COOF was basically going around in Wuhan. And they were predicting that a coronavirus would sweep the world. Pretty interesting stuff. But hey, it's just all coincidence. Just all coincidence. Life is stranger than fiction, isn't it? In any case, folks, this has been All Minus One Storytime with Bill. And I wish you all well.